Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Harris Pastides, former president of the University of South Carolina. Harris is a leader's leader and the right type of leader for the 21st century university. Harris comes from humble beginnings. Born to immigrants, he was the first person in his family to attend college. And what a career he's had. UMass Amherst, University of South Carolina as Dean, VP of Research, and President two times, including his being the first internal candidate in over 50 years, a testament to his expertise and leadership skills. But what distinguishes, in my mind, in Harris, is his caring nature and his student-centeredness. He's kind to all. In recent conversations I had with multiple students at U of SC, they all spoke fondly of him, his having an open door, his willingness to take selfies with students, and his being the authentic leader when tragedy struck the campus community, when there was no playbook for a president. That is the true measure of a leader, and that is Harris Pastides. Harris, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Drum. I've been looking forward to being with you. Likewise, you have just stepped down from your second stint at the University of South Carolina. How does it feel to be retired again? <laughs> well, I'm, I've practiced it, and uh, I know the things I, I don't like to do, like uh, fishing and, and uh, sleeping late at night and waking up late in the morning. And so I don't have to fiddle with that foolishness. I could just go into the things I, <laughs> I know I will enjoy. It's, it's a good feeling. That's great. And, you know, of course, you've got the opportunity to travel a little bit. Well, travel is always on the agenda. Of course, I've got a uh, partner, a wife, and uh, we occasionally uh, have different feelings about that. But we've just returned from uh, Middle Maine on the coast and we're about to head to Italy. And at the same time that the uh, student body is arriving here at the university. So it's a little jarring feeling to know that convocation is coming up and uh, move-in day just occurred. And we're going off to Tuscany. It's actually a, well, did I say a jarring feeling? It's actually a splendid feeling to know that. Yeah, well, that's that's wonderful. And, you know, you've, you've given so much of your life, both you and Patricia, given so much of your life to the University of South Carolina. You deserve to have these times off. So congratulations on two successful stints. Thank you. Thank you, Drum. So we're very fortunate, very blessed today, because we're going to have a, a conversation about one of my favorite topics, leadership, and specifically leadership for the 21st century university. I mean, when I take a look at your career at South Carolina, and your life, for that matter, you have been able to do some amazing things. You know, you you know, you come from humble beginnings. You know, first you know, first generation college student, just an amazing background. And what you've done there at South Carolina, the number one honors college in the U.S., the number one student freshman experience, just some amazing things. What would you say the key is to your success? Well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. And I will immediately defer a lot of that to the people who are uh, closer to the ground. Uh, two things I would say, Drum, and maybe we can explore both. The first is to create a relationship of trust and integrity, to be a good listener. But the other thing is to know which opportunity to avail yourself of. I think a university president is not someone who has to go out and find opportunity. There's so much opportunity that comes at, at a president uh, all the time, but to know, you know, which of those uh, arrows, if you will, to catch and to maintain and which ones to let go by. And I think we spend too much time worrying about, you know, oh my gosh, you know, where, where is the opportunity and what should I do? But it really is around us all the time. 
And so uh, work, working closely with great people, being focused, and we'll talk more about all of these things, and creating a, a reputation of open communication and being trustworthy. Well, I, you, you have been able to do that in spades, so to speak. I've never known a president that the students, and when I've spoken to multiple students there, he says, he, he's fabulous. He'll stop and talk with us as we're walking through the quad, or we'll, we'll go up to him and want to take a selfie. And, you know, he's always willing to do that. That's leadership in, it, in its purest form. It, it is. And, and I think South Carolina, maybe the South, I don't mean to stereotype, but it requires it. It's not it's not just an asset to be that way. When I when I first rolled in as dean of public health in 1998, it was a lovely uh, woman, a janitor who told me that I, I couldn't park in a particular parking spot because the new dean was going to claim it. And I <laughs> I told her, well, I, I was the new dean. And uh, I didn't know how she would react, but she came and threw her arms around me and told me, we've been waiting for you. You know, we've been waiting for you. Welcome, Dr. Pastides. Uh, and I knew right away that this was a, a kind and, and sincere place. And, and so with the students, uh, I don't think I ever said no to one student who wanted a high five, which is on, on their bucket list or a selfie. And when I did retire the first time, they presented me with a, a beautiful high-tech portrait of the university, but every little corner of it was a digital uh, reflection of a selfie that I had taken with somebody else. Apparently, they called for them, and uh, the IT people were flooded with these selfies. It, it's really one of my fondest uh, souvenirs, I would say, of the presidency. And Pam told me, your your assistant for many, many years, told me that she would get phone calls from students saying that, oh, I spoke to Dr. Bastides and he told me to call and make an appointment. <laughs> and, 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 and she would grimace and say, there he goes again. Uh, <laughs> and she would say, did you really want to see that that sophomore who you met walking on the horseshoe and I said, I, I don't remember, but you know, give, give him, give him or her twenty minutes. Come on, let them come in. I get to know them. They usually, uh, you know, they come with their backpack. I ask about them. I uh, offer to help them or advise them, and then Pam comes in and knocks on the door and says it's time to go. Takes a photo of us, and and I again, I did that countless times. Many people would say it was a a waste of time. But I view it like putting a, a coin in a piggy bank and you amass goodwill and trust. And you really need that when the, when the times are tough, uh, when you have to raise tuition or when, you know, you can't rename a building that the people would prefer that you do. They remember that you're a good fellow. And so you draw on that bank account, you know, later in time. And, and that is so critical, especially in those situations that you described. Leadership is so critical, but it's changed. And what we expect of our leaders has changed over the years. What would you say are the key qualities that, you know, used to be in the past and what they need to be now? Well, yeah, that, uh, certainly in the past, uh, people would call on, you know, the qualities of, uh, of uh, financial management and strategic planning. Uh, the experience of running a large organization, they, they haven't gone away. Those are valuable uh, commodities, if you will. But if you have those and, and don't have the human side, the, the leadership that people want to have and, and want to follow or walk along with, I, I like to, to say, Drum, that I lead from the middle. Uh, what does that mean? Well, there are a lot of leaders uh, who lead from the front and you know, if you're uh, in the military, you better lead from the front. You know, if you're leading a, a battalion into battle, that's the right way to be. But I prefer to be, you know, somewhere in the middle. Uh, let other people who you're walking with and moving with uh, take the lead occasionally. So you don't have to look around and know if people are there. And so the traditional qualities were 
what has somebody accomplished in their career and what do they know about those really big uh, pressing matters. Uh, but I think now, whether it's leadership in, in politics or in a not-for-profit or in a university, it really is the human being. Is that somebody that I would really like to work with or, or, or talk to? Would he or she really listen to me? And what, what can we really find in common? Where's the common ground and how can we work together? What I hear you talking about is trust building in many respects. Is that right? Yes. Trust based on integrity, personal values. Uh, let people see your values. You, you don't have to tell them. I don't think I ever told anybody what my values were, uh, but I certainly uh, feel that people knew them relative to freedom of expression and what we used to call tolerance. And now we talk about DEI. And I think people need to know the values of their leader. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, those things, the trust building, integrity, authenticity. You know, when we talked before, you made a, a point and it really resonated with me. It was like authenticity. Can the leader be believed? Not always agreed with, but believed. Indeed, there, there were times when I exposed my uh, human frailties and I think in other walks of life, that would be considered a weakness for a leader when there might have been, uh, not might have been, but when there were tragedies on campus, as an example. Uh, you know, I, I don't think the qualities of being stoic or, you know, uh, what, what you would see in a, in a Hallmark greeting card are really what people want to see at that time. They want to know that I'm a a father, a husband, a son, a brother, a person, and that I'm able to, and I do feel uh, pain or anger, as the case may be, and other times at a football game, maybe uh, be as wild and crazy uh, as the kids next to me. Now, I won't throw, I won't throw things at the referee, uh, and I won't use obscenities, <laughs> but they'll, they'll see me getting hot and bothered at a Saturday night football game. They've seen that many times. Yeah. And, and I'll bet Patricia was, you know, sitting right next to you saying, Harris, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. You're the president. Don't, you know, don't, don't show that. Don't show your frustration. And, and, and I would say, but that number 13, that why did he just drop the ball in the end zone? That could have been exactly what we needed to seal the win, you know, as my head is buried in my hands. And she'd say, no, 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 no. And I'm like, I can't, I just can't help it. Okay, I'll try to be better, but I, I'm never better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. And, and the, the, the showing of feelings, it's not necessarily emoting or emotion, but the, the honest feelings. I mean, you had an incident during your presidency, you know, the Uber incident with one of the co-eds who, you know, tragically was killed because of it. There's no playbook for something like that. How do you, how do you deal with something like that? Well, you, you do lean on, in my case, Patricia, you know, my, my partner. And uh, we heard about that very, very early on a Sunday morning. It, the uh, tragedy occurred on a Saturday night. We, we were told that the family had already come down from New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and uh, that they were at the hotel. And I, I said, can, can, can we go talk to them? Not knowing what I would say. <laughs> and the uh, grief counselor said, yeah, they may be around later in the day, you could come by. And, and we did. And, uh, you know, I gathered, I summoned, all, both of us did all of the uh, strength that we could. But, you know, I, a drum, I, I never went to a playbook. I never went to a, uh, a grief management or grief counseling. I just, you know, talked to the dad and the mom and the brother like a family member. I, I didn't know their daughter, but I told them what, what she meant to me because she had chosen our university and therefore was part of our family. And we continue to talk today in the interim, though, we, had, we held vigils and, 
we, we helped uh, start and we still work with Uber on a platform to improve rideshare safety. But I know you brought that up in terms of leadership. So the last thing in my mind was how I would be viewed. But in watching me over those few days and, and hearing me and reading my emails and uh, being at the campus vigil, I think people knew that I was someone who, who felt the pain and the anger of a family member. And I think we, we, we resolved, if you will, to, to be a better institution afterwards. And there would have been no playbook, no playbook for that. No, there really isn't. Reminds me of what uh, my first accreditation visit that I went on, the leadership, the, the, the key leader at that institution. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That struck me. Well, that, that is exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, I believe that's true. I believe that is true uh, in our land, in our politics right now. Uh, no, nobody, I as a voter, I'm not looking to agree 100% of the time with anybody from either party. Now, now agreement is important. You, you want a leader who you agree with some of the time anyway, and hopefully most of the time. But we, when you don't agree with them, you kind of say, well, I, I think maybe they got that one wrong, but you know that's okay. By by and large, the good person doing a good job, and I, I'm going to support them. Yeah, and and that's it. It's it's like life. You take the good, you discard the bad, or work with the bad, and sometimes you don't have that opportunity with people that you're leading. You have to work with all, so it requires a patience. It requires a humbleness. It requires good communications. I mean, all of these qualities that make up a good leader. And, and, you know, when you accrue them, and it does take a while, people told me, you know, hey, you run a big university. You have 37,000 students on the main campus, 55,000 students uh, throughout the state on eight campuses. You know, wh why bother? why bother meeting one student or even a hundred students, you can't get to know it, uh, everybody, but really you can. I can't tell you, Drum, how many times people have told me, it's as if I know you. Now, you never met me, but I know you. I know you through my friends. I know, the, know them through your e-blasts. I know you through your social media platform. And uh, thank you for all you're doing. So you, you, can, you can make a very, very large institution feel smaller and more personal if you do that. On the other hand, all of the strategic planning in the world, and I'm not suggesting it's not important, of course it is, is not going to help you in a moment where you really need the support of a community, of a university community. You're absolutely right. It's, I, I look at it as, you know, what are the leadership traits that a leader has to have? What are the management skills that leader needs to have. They're really two separate buckets. Surely. And, and another one we haven't touched on yet really is a global perspective. I grew up in, uh, in New York City, a global, a global city, and I had uh, families in my neighborhood that were far different from my, my own. So yes, we were, we were an immigrant family and uh, I was bilingual. We spoke Greek in the household. Uh, but it's not like we lived with all Greek people. We had Italian and German, African-American, Puerto Rican, Chinese, Indian. And I remember being invited to my Indian friend's playmate, if you will, house for dinner. His name was Mukund Bharate. I, I wonder where he is today. I hope he's doing well. I was used to more the, the Greek food or the roast beef. And his mother served me Indian food. And the smells, the colors, the spices were so different. And it, it, it's not how much I liked it or didn't like it. It's the fact that at a, young, at a young age, I began to understand that we're all the same. You know, the food we eat is different. But, you know, his parents would yell at him for 
you know, coming home late, just like mine would. And Puerto Rican kids and my friends, and we all played baseball and, and, and tried to assimilate best we could. But at a very young age, I saw people who were very different than me. And then throughout my life, I had Fulbright one time to Europe. I had another sabbatical. I went to the World Health Organization. I studied French with my family, uh, have traveled all over the world. And I think that that is another asset to a leader to be able to identify and relate to a much broader constituency. Even though it's not your own background, it, it's very important to, to show your knowledge and respect for so many other cultures. You've hit it on the head. It, it is that knowledge, but more importantly, that respect. You know, there may be differences on the outside, how we think, how we act, you know, the way we look, et cetera. But in reality, we're all one and the same. No, no doubt. And uh, to have uh, been <laughs> in those places, sometimes uh, our graduate students are shocked. You've been to Dhaka? Yes, I have. And I will tell them an anecdote about it. You know, when a, when a typhoon came through or uh, love the food, you know, you always prefer to, to bring up something pleasant or or Vietnam, or as the case may be. And, and so I think for others, for people who are planning on a career in leadership, it's very, very important, super important, I would say, to try to be broad enough uh, through travel, through reading, of course, to, to study history. And by the way, when I became president, I, I probably was given 10 or 15 books on how to be a great leader. And I, I'm grateful that I got them, but I really didn't read them. I read books about the history of this place, of this university, of this state. I read other things that I, a leader ought to, ought to know and relied more on my own, um, you know, my own philosophy of leadership. Now, that's not to say people listening shouldn't listen to this, to this podcast or even read good books on <laughs> leadership. But I think sometimes uh, too much is made about a formula. And I think uh, back to authenticity, I think anybody who's gotten, you know, a stone's throw from the presidency is already very able, very capable. And at that point, go with who you are. Don't, don't try to invent yourself and be Winston Churchill or who, whoever else you might <laughs> You might uh, respect Barack Obama, whoever else it might be, because you're, you're not them. You, you'll be working too hard at that for too long. You know, we all have that innate individualism. And how is it that we can bring that out to be the authentic leader that others and that we need to see in ourselves? That's, to me, the key question. Well, I think, I think we need self-confidence, and I think the, the way to get that is with a mentor. I continue to have, through the presidency and even today, a couple of people who I look to. Now, I don't contact them a lot, but I would. I certainly would if I needed to. But when I was 30 and 40 and 50, there were people who kind of looked at me and said, Harris, you're, you're going places. And, and I would be, what? You know, uh, yeah, I, I could see it. I could see how people relate to you. You know, be yourself and don't say no. And, uh, you know, I had the best job in the university uh, at UMass and Amherst, and I was a full professor. And the dean came to me and said, we need a new department chair. And I said, darn right, we do. And he said... <laughs> That would be you. And I said, oh, you got to be kidding. Uh, it, that's not who I am. I'm motivated to publish more and write. If I could write one more grant a year. And he said, well, well don't complain then. You don't want to be part of the solution. Then you're going to be part of the problem. Think about it for a weekend. And I did. And, uh, you know, being a department chair tested me. As you well know, Drum, that is a hard job because uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't really have much power. You've got to tell your colleagues when they're teaching and what they're teaching. 
and do it as a colleague. And from department chair, uh, I became a dean and a vice president and provost, uh, and then a college president. But, uh, you know, at, at some point I was off and running because other people believed in me. Well, you're getting into one of my, my pet, I shouldn't say pet peeves, but my pet subjects about higher ed is how do we do a better job in training that next generation of leaders? Well, I think we're, we're doing a better job. We're doing it formally. There are three different uh, programs we, we have here for younger academicians. One is internal to our university system. The other one comes through our athletic conference, the 14 universities in the SEC. And the third one is targeted more at uh, women and female leaders. Each one of them probably entertains about 15, roughly, could be 12 or 10 to 15 individuals who are, you know, I would say upwardly mobile. They meet with people. Of course, we talk about what it's really like, the good, the bad, and the unknown, the untold. And so I think the way we do that uh, drum is to do it formally and and really make it a, uh, a journey rather than... Uh, the other thing an institution could do is assign a mentor more one-on-one, -on -one, and I've done some of that as well. But uh, yeah, if we don't do that, then we're not going to be succeeded. We're not going to have the right people to, uh, to come along and not only do as well as we did, but to do far better, I hope. Yeah, that is so true. Institutions need to have more formal and informal paths for leaders. You know, the, the one thing is, you know, jumping into a department chair position, you're taking somebody who does research and they may or they may not have the, the people skills necessary, but these formalized training programs can help them make that shift from colleague to boss. Now, occasionally people get very uh, excited uh, when they graduate from a program like that, and there may not be an opening at the home institution, and you've created a dynamic where someone will begin looking to go away. But I, I think you can't lead your life worried about that all the time. If you've created a great opportunity for a young or emerging leader and they take a job somewhere else as an associate provost, a department chair, really whatever it might be, I think that's okay because you've done, done something wonderful for them. Well, you know, look at South Carolina's new president, Michael Amorides. I mean, just an incredible scholar on his own right, but he was your provost there when you, your first time at the helm there in South Carolina, he left to go to the University of Illinois, Chicago, and just did an incredible job there. Now he's coming back with seven years of experience. Sometimes it's really good for somebody to move away so they can bring that extra experience back or to another institution. Oh, he, he is far better uh, having gone and come back than to have remained here. And that's a painful thing to say. I remember when he told me he was leaving, I begged him not to. I said, you, you know, you can, you can succeed me. You're the right person. Just stay. And he winked at me and said, I'll be back. And, uh, and, of course, <laughs> and by the way, not, not, a, not a feather in my cap, but Every single provost that served me, all four became very successful university presidents. Uh, Mark Becker, who is now the head of APLU at Georgia State. Joan Gable, who's now the president of the University of Minnesota. Bill Tate, who is the president of LSU, although he and I overlapped only a short while. And Michael Amaritas. So really, uh, how wonderful to... Uh, both have leaned on them when we work together and now to see their uh, just beautiful career steps and to remain very, very friendly. And they're people now who are my mentors as well. If I was in a jam, I would call out, could call any one of them to, to ask them for support. And, and that is the testament of a true leader is how you train your potential successors. It really is. It really is. We are getting to the end of our time. It's just, I, I, 
I knew this was just going to fly by. <laughs> it always does. So, Harris, three takeaways for university presidents and aspiring presidents on leadership. Okay, and in no particular order, I, I do think it's important uh, to have a good private life. Let me, let me just start there. In, in my case, with a spouse, not everybody has to be married, but you, you do need uh, a place to go to, uh, a rock and a cave, uh, or, you know, a, a solid place where you can uh, rejuvenate and remember that everything's going to be all right. And uh, other people draw on other things. Some people have a faith community, some don't. But very important to have a place where on a rainy day you can you can seek uh, support and comfort because the job is so, so hard. Number two, find great people and listen to them. Occasionally, even if you're disagreeable with something, let, let them go their way. Let them lead the way is what I meant to say. And don't don't make them feel like, okay, well, I think I think you're going down a bad, a bad road and everything's gonna come crashing down, but go ahead. I don't mean like that. I mean more in the context of, you know, it, it's not the path I would have chosen, but I, I really can see what you're saying. Could be in student affairs, for example. I, I can really see that. So let's try it. And this is very important to be, you know, with good people and uh, to let them fly and to let them lead with you. And finally, the students, the students, the students, be, be with them, be personal, let them know you, laugh with them. You don't have to cry with them, but, you know, laugh with them, you know, let them see you at the basketball game, hanging your head, let, you know, let them see you. <laughs> at a memorial service, take out your handkerchief, uh, let them see you in your office if they need a 20 minute appointment to tell you their little story, because it really is all about the students. And that is probably, uh, along with being a good communicator, I, I have a collection of about 50 messages that I sent to students over my uh, 12 years in the presidency. I'm, I'm actually very happy with them and I hope to collate them. And I'm not sure what I'll do with them exactly, but maybe I'll send them to you, Drum. Have a look. Tell me what you think. Maybe we can find a way to disseminate the better ones anyway. I would be honored, sir. I would be honored. So, Harris, what's next for you? I mean, are you going to fail in retirement a second time? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, uh, but happily, uh, happily fail. I am a, a trustee of the American Medical Association. I help run the Fulbright program for the uh, State Department. That goes with my global tendencies, of course. I do a lot of not-for-profit work. I'll do some writing. Uh, I'm on a bank board. No dearth of uh, activity. Uh, but I'm also going to put time into becoming that better husband, better father, better grandfather, a better brother uh, by by visiting more. A drum, you know, do you know how many birthdays I missed or, you know, friends, son or daughter wedding that I couldn't get to because it conflicted with this or that or the other thing? I'm going to start saying yes and uh, attending those things. And when... Uh, Michael Amaritas needs me. I'll be on the other end of the phone for him, too. Very good, sir. Well, Harris, it's been a pleasure. You have your official thank you send off on Friday of this week. I am so looking forward to being able to shake your hand and say thank you for all your service to South Carolina and to higher education. Thank you. Thank you. I'll look forward to being with you then. Take care, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for listening today, and a special thanks to Dr. Harris Pastides, former president of the University of South Carolina, and for his sharing with us what it takes to be a leader in the 21st century higher education institution. Our next guest is Rick Beyer, executive chair of Core Education. 
Rick will be joining us to talk about innovative approaches to providing shared services to small and mid-sized higher education institutions, innovative ways for cost sharing and improving technology. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. And we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.